I want to thank all of you for graciously accepting the invitation to be with us this week as we celebrate our 60th anniversary as a seminary in Austin, Texas. And I also really want to thank the Most Reverend Catherine Jefford Shorey for being here with us to celebrate this wonderful moment in our lives. Our faculty, seminarians, our staff are very, very pleased you're all here. It's a wonderful two days of community and celebration, and we have a great deal to celebrate. Now, I can't see who's out there, so I'm going to call some names and ask you to stand and assume you have. Uh, <laughs> I want to begin by thanking the Alumni Steering Committee for recognizing that this gathering would be a perfect time to ask the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church to be present with us. And as I call your name, if you're here, please stand. These are the members of our uh, steering committee, Chad Vaughn, Reed Morgan. Reed, I know you're here. Okay, thank you. Please stay for up for a second. Uh, Ashley Brandon. Dave Segano, and Kevin Schubert. Would you all please let these folk appreciate, know how much you appreciate their idea. <laughs> I'd like also to recognize the presence of those bishops I know to be here. I would like to begin with Bishop Dina Harrison, who is a South African bishop of the Diocese of Texas and also the chair of our board. And I know Dean is here. Dina, please stand. <laughs> I'd like to recognize our, the diocesan bishop that Dina and I share, and Bishop Andrew Doyle. Andy is doing a wonderful job of being our diocesan. If you'd please stand. And I know our newest suffragan, Bishop Jeff Fisher, is here also somewhere. Yeah. I believe both Bishops Littlebridge and Reed have had to return to the Diocese of West Texas to San Antonio this evening, so I don't think they're here this evening. Uh, Bishop, no, Bishop Reed had to take off. Uh, Bishop Scott Mayer, I know, is here. He's here all the way from Lubbock, so that's a... And Bishop Payne and his wonderful wife, Barbara, are here. They are leading our campaign for leadership. Of course, he is the... Uh, <laughs> bishop Payne's the retired bishop of the Diocese of Texas, as if anybody didn't know that. But he and Barbara are doing a wonderful job of contributing untold hours to the future of this seminary, and we're very, very grateful. I'm going to say a few words about Bishop Catherine, and then I'll hand the podium to her. Catherine Jefford Shorey was elected presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in 2006. 2006, she was the first woman elected a primate in the Anglican Communion. She serves as our chief pastor and primate to the Episcopal Church's members in 16 countries and 110 dioceses. She joins with other principal bishops of the 38 member provinces, 38 member provinces of the Worldwide Anglican Communion, seeking a common cause for global good and reconciliation. Over the course of her term, she has been responsible and is responsible for initiating and developing policy for the Episcopal Church and speaks on behalf of the church regarding the policy strategies and programs authorized by general convention. She has been vocal about the Episcopal Church's mission priorities, including the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, issues of domestic poverty, climate change, care for the earth, and as well, she attends very often to the needs to contextualize the gospel, something she did beautifully today in her sermon during the Eucharist. She is quite simply charged to speak God's word to the church and to the world. Bishop Jefford Shorey's career as an oceanographer preceded her studies for the priesthood to which she was ordained in 1994. She holds a BS in biology from Stanford University and an MS and a PhD in oceanography from Oregon State University. And I surmise you're the first primate to have a PhD in oceanography as well. 
Okay. <clears throat> she also has an MDiv from the Church Divinity School of the Pacific, and she is the, has been the recipient of several honorary doctorates, including one from this seminary, for which we're ver about which we're very happy. She remains an active instrument-rated pilot, a skill she applied when traveling between the congregations of the Diocese of Nevada, where she was elected bishop in 2000. At the time of her election as presiding bishop, she was, uh, excuse me, as the bishop of Nevada, she was a priest, university lecturer, and hospice chaplain. She grew up in the Seattle area, has spent most of her life in the West, she and her husband, Richard Miles Shorey, who is a retired mathematician, were married in 1979, and they have one daughter who is a captain and a pilot in the United States Air Force. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so now would you please welcome our special guest, guest Bishop Catherine. Thank you very much. I, I think it's dangerous to let people bring beer in here. <laughs> there are more seats down front, as is normal in Episcopal churches. Please, please come and sit. Um, you, you'll get tired of standing, I'm sure. But, and please, it's not a fuss. I want to talk about leadership in the present as well as in the coming years at a time when everything around us is changing more rapidly than most of us can imagine. I also want to use organic imagery to talk about it, imagery that goes back to the foundations of the Christian tradition. I want to talk about bodies, the body of Christ, the body each of us inhabits, and the body of God's creation. I understand bodies as living and dynamic. Is there a light on here? Doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> Dang it. Bodies are living and dynamic, always dying and being resurrected. And think about in your own bodies the daily cellular turnover, death and resurrection or the life cycles of stars and, of, and galaxies, death and resurrection. In the broad sense, bodies reflect something essential about how the image of God is present in creation. One of the reasons that resurrection is so central to Christians is because it involves bodies, how they are cherished, how they change and are transformed, and that they are essential to knowing God. I'm going to ask the Fitzo to run the video. I want to start by looking at a very recent story about looking for leaders in a rapidly changing body. It's from the Diocese of Chelmsford in the Church of England, and it's probably going to be pretty self-explanatory. jokes about the, this is the dead centre of the village or anything, you just do the same line again and try to keep still this time, okay? Wait, wait a minute, wait, we're not doing that again. No, it's no, just oh, not, I'm not. you've just got to stand there. Right. Right, cut. What do you want me to do? Cut. Here we are in St Mary's churchyard, a beautiful churchyard as you can see, but we have a grave situation. We have no vicar. We have people coming from South Woodham to be buried here, but we need a new vicar. Okay? The parish of Woodham Ferris and Bickmaker in Essex decided to make a video to help recruit a new vicar. You see, we have a lot of weddings, but we've got no vicar. We have a lot of baptisms, but we've got no vicar. 
We've got a lovely Church of England primary school, but we've got no vicar. Good morning, Peter. Unfortunately, the camera work was shaky. No, I've got a direct line through to the red geraniums, and you're in it. The sound was poor. The director lacked vision. Here we are in St Mary's Church. Oh, I don't think I quite got out the shot there, Colin. Let's just do that. Take in fact, fine. we were so busy okay, organising Bible study. Cypher and special church services that we had to cut the film short. So, for more information about our parish vacancy, visit our website or go to the Chelsea Diocesan website and see our parish profile because our parish needs you. Back on because it's got we've got to have continuity. I'll give you comment. <laughs> Very nicely laid out. <laughs> what are you doing? You're not saying. Here we are at St Mary's Churchyard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Look at the massive jacket. He's all wet. Oh, I know, but I can't <laughs> stop. We I have can't. no vicar. back to the PowerPoint. Small village community of mostly older vestry members able to use the latest or at least close to the latest IT methods in searching for the next vicar. If they can do it, it's coming to your neighborhood too. Body theology. We are adept at reflecting on the stories of creation particularly the creation of human beings. Those stories are an essential part of how the Christian community knows that God is part of the human condition. And those stories are essential to our understanding of what it means to be participants in God's creation. The fullness of what it means to be a human creature, that we're bodied spirits or in spirited bodies, means that we participate in relationship to the divine, which is why we often use all of the sensory input we can muster in worship. Being in relationship with God means full-bodied participation using all our gifts. Like all gifts, they can be misused or distorted. Part of faithful life and leadership is about using all the gifts we've been given in appropriate balance. I think it's helpful to think about ministry as to show up, to pay attention, to tell the truth, and to leave the ultimate results to God. That kind of Christian life and witness means using all our gifts, showing up completely, body and soul, with every wart and beauty mark you have, to pay attention with every sense you can muster and then to tell the full truth of what you know. Don't be anxious about the results. That's God's work. If you've done yours to the full, God will be in the midst of it. Think about ministry as bearing our image of God as co-creators with God and full participants in God's ongoing mission of creation. Ministry is about serving bodies, both individual bodies and the kind of bodies we call communities, like the body of Christ. That shepherd has shown up, and he's read the context and adapted to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's a reminder that we are all both sheep and shepherds that ministry is about recognizing and reconciling that dual reality. Showing up is about integration, 
And listening well has to do with reading the context and or the signs of the times. Each one of us is both leader and disciple, sheep and shepherd, minister of the gospel, and recipient of unbidden good news and grace. Sometimes the unbidden context is challenging. Can we see the image of God when we look in the mirror? Can we celebrate the image of God in our neighbor? Jesus would be hanging out here, I think. And here. He's the bearer or wearer of St. George and the Dragon. For those who don't have a Bible app, the, this verse from Galatians says, From now on, let no one make trouble for me, for I carry the marks of Jesus branded on my body. And this one says it all. Only God can judge me. The body has unpredictable members. And ones that challenge us. And each of us certainly challenges some of the other members. The body of Christ doesn't just have sheep. These are goats. And they make their living by grazing in trees in northern Africa. There are other surprising members of the body. What do you see here? Sometimes, like Balaam's conversation partner, they have something very important to teach us. Sometimes the members of the body pretend to be who they aren't. And the shepherds must all take note. Even those who fleece the members without their consent have to be cared for. And I picked this one because it looks vaguely like Bishop Turkle in the back. There is no one wholly outside the body. Everyone must be appropriately cared for, for we are all connected. There aren't any exceptions when it comes to loving neighbor, although it's not always easy. The body of Christ includes the familiar and the unfamiliar, certainly fellow Anglicans and not just bishops. And in England, it's probably fair to say that it's past time to include all the ones who wear dresses. If we can begin to love everybody in this picture, there is hope for all of us. And it will strengthen our capacity for work in the local neighborhood. The body of Christ has Christians of many sorts and conditions in many nations, denominations, and kinds of community. Sometimes it's easier to learn from those who are a bit farther away the pan-Christian body, the ecumenical flock. Leaders in this century must find friends in unfamiliar places across the street and across the globe. These are all from the World Student Christian Federation. But the body is not limited to Christians. The body who are inheritors of Abraham's promises, you know, descendants, land, and blessing, that body includes Jews and Muslims and Christians. We share the same roots, and we share many of the same stories, even when we interpret them differently. The body of God's promise cannot abide division among us. Dialogue among the Abrahamic faiths is urgent and essential, and we need leaders who have the courage to build relationships and partnerships with our closest siblings, both here and across the globe. I think this may be the most urgent of our opportunities for theological dialogue, particularly as Muslims begin to wrestle with non-Arab contexts. I had a remarkable conversation yesterday with a Muslim leader 
in challenging his co-religionists in other nations, particularly in predominantly Muslim countries, challenging them about what democracy and non-Arab context might mean for the development of Islam. Friday prayers in Spanish, women in leadership. We need to be observers at least in those conversations and humble dialogue partners. The spirit is certainly at work in those meetings of prophetic speech. But the body of God's creation doesn't stop with Abraham. The whole human family of God reflects the divine image. God's spirit is at work in places and communities where Christians have not always looked carefully. The world of God's creation cannot afford our blindness. There's one more body, the body of God, as Sally McVeigh puts it, the whole creation, which must also bear the divine imprint of its source, the earth and all its creatures, the sun and moon and stars, the whole of the cosmos. Shepherd leaders understand that they are servants of the whole. Servant leaders cultivate the holistic and holy vision that God spoke in blessing all that had been created, and God saw that it was good. The mission we share as children of God, friends of Jesus, and inheritors of the promise to Abraham, that mission is about all creation restored. It's about the trans and the transformation which we believe begins again with God's incarnation in human flesh. Consider the body of shared vision, which for us begins with the prophets and the poets of the Hebrew scriptures who point to a world of peace with justice. It's all about right relationships and an end to the powers of evil. It's the mission of God, the reign of God, what some have called the God movement. It is to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with the one God. It is to give evidence of the hope within us for a healed and transformed body of God's creation. That vision has partners who are not overtly people of faith. This appeared on Thanksgiving Day in the New York Times, a gift from Yoko Ono. Can you read it in the back? Give peace a chance. Happy Thanksgiving, love Yoko. www.imaginepeace.com Leaders in this era have to, be, have to be looking for partners in unlikely places. The vision of a peaceable kingdom and of peoples who study war no more needs all the partners around us, all parts of the body of God's creation. What did Jesus mean when he said that the kingdom of God is around you and among you and within you? Our leaders need to be able to discern the godly reflection in the people around them and to go looking for partners for God's mission. We miss the mark if we ignore anyone who shares a vision for that healed world of shalom, salam, shanti. Like the image of that woolly shepherd, who begins to think and look like the flock he's charged with caring for, the context in which we're set challenges us to find ways of responding that can begin to respond adequately and appropriately. Mission begins in an inward, begins in an outward focus, an attention to being for the other, a transformation and conversion of heart. It's always rooted in the local community, but it bends toward the global. We live in a profoundly connected world, one that's getting more so all the time. Not just electronically, but in the air we breathe, the heat we endure, the fuel we consume, 
the food we eat and the ways we grow it. Eat has enormous consequences for other life on this planet. We are members one of another, whether we want to be or not, whether we recognize it or not. We also live in a context that changes overnight, and our awareness of those changes is equally quick. Prediction is hard, other than being able to say, expect the unexpected. But basic Christian hope brings a perspective that sees all of this chaos as fertile matter for the working of God's creative spirit. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void. That creation born of chaos and the creative word of God is good news to a world living in fear and want and darkness. But that word must be incarnated in every context, including ones that we have not discovered yet. That word speaks abundant life for all creation, all creation. Leaders for this creative and chaotic time need courage, need to be willing to risk traveling in that desert wilderness and the lively waters. They need to be able to try new ways and help others let go of dead ways. That living truth we know sets us free for that work. If you can't ask questions, get out of the nave until you learn how. <laughs> Study children if you need lessons. <laughs> that is, after all, the rabbinical method. Jesus used it well. If you're going to ask questions, ask the hard ones. They're the most important. Ask the deeper questions, the prophetic ones that can only be asked from a prophetic stance on the edge, a place where you can see both God's cosmic vision of a healed creation and the local pains and distorted relationships that do not offer life and freedom. Those questions help others to name the gap and begin to build a bridge from what is to what is meant to be. Those questions begin the work of reconciling and healing and transformation. The truth will set you free to ask questions that are a form of incarnate word, the word that sets us free for all sorts of chaotic co-creation. The world and this church need your willingness to partner with God in creating something new from the chaos. Partner with God in the midst of the chaos and bring others into the bridge building work. The servant work of ministry comes in all forms of holy living, where people are living for the holy wholeness that is God's dream. Leaders in this age have to discover where the spirit is already at work and collaborate with it, which is another way of saying, be co-creators with God. We need leaders who are comfortable with new ways of working, who will find partners at all levels, inside and outside the institution, to dream the great dream of God and act here and now. The kinds of partnerships that are possible come in surprising places, and the business world gets this. I'm going to read this to you because I'm not sure you're going to be able to see it in the back. This is from Huffington Post's Latino Voices. Business is no longer just about profits. 
but about enhancing every life and community that we touch. The focus should expand beyond shareholders to include all other stakeholders. This expanded circle of influences need to, needs to be addressed through comprehensive and integrated approaches that drive business and macroeconomic well-being over time. To achieve this, leaders need to have a holistic view of the world, one that combines economic, political, social, consumer, and technological trends. We can partner with that commercial sphere. Episcopal Relief and Development is doing it in Nets for Life. Their partners include Standard Chartered Bank, Exxon Mobil, Coca-Cola Africa, as well as two private philanthropic foundations, J.C. Flowers and Star International. Together, in the last few years, Nets for Life has distributed 11 million malaria nets, helping to heal more than 25 million people. It took a willingness to think about the network of the Anglican Communion, which is the third largest distribution system in the world, third largest beyond the end of the road. It took a willingness to think outside the church box and a willingness to dream immensely big dreams. The varied networks in which we're get, going to need to function, and in many of them at the same time, can all be understood as bodies. Some of them are more overtly organic than others, but they all have active members, they make choices, they do creative things, which means they're not predictable, except perhaps statistically. Organic systems and living bodies are adaptable. They're in continual communication, and they're somewhat fluid about roles. We've learned something about that from looking at the ability of the brain to shift pathways after it's had major damage. That kind of plasticity is a sign of health in a body. Systems and communities that are plastic and adaptable are more robust, resilient, livable, inviting, and lively. They have much more to do with the kind of abundant life that Jesus talks about. They respond to the chaos of life with healing, wholeness, and love. They are creative. One of the bigger challenges for a body like the Episcopal Church in this changing context has to do with thinking in different ways about how we make decisions and relate to one another. We've actually been moving back toward this kind of relational understanding for quite a while. You know that prayer book we still call new? That's because we haven't learned everything there is to learn from it. It's encouraged us to think about baptism as ministry, and it affirms the laity as the first ministers of God's mission. We've always had an understanding that decision-making involves shared authority in this church, even, even at the times in our history when we've devolved into other rather more vertical structures. Where do we begin as leaders in this body called the Episcopal Church? A major part has to be about helping healthy and holistic systems to grow in their capacity for service in the midst of chaos. We need leaders who can help others become vessels of transformation in all parts of life. Ministry cannot be a word that's limited to service to the institution. We have to reclaim that word as a sign of basic and essential Christian living in the world, as being participants in God's mission. I believe that theological education resources, the ones at hand, the seminaries, diocesan formation programs, and any ecumenical and interreligious partners we can muster as well as some supposedly secular resources, need to be drawn into networks that will help us do this work of formation. 
We need to partner with communicators and community organizers and all sorts and conditions of people if we're going to set bearers of the word free for transformation in the world. The local is linked with the global primarily through the great commandment. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. If we aren't loving our neighbors, if we're living in a distorted way, then our neighbors are going to suffer, both those next door and those across the planet. That's a most challenging reality for all of us. We live in a garden that's shared, and we are stewards of the whole of it. Care of the garden and the flock needs the particular creative gifts of all the members, and there are connections between those very local gifts and more global realities. For example, the way a Sunday school teacher forms conversation in a children's class can teach how to respect the dignity of all, and it will have an impact on how those children treat their neighbors, including after they've grown into parents and scientists and soldiers. There is something holographic about the reign of God and our attention to God's mission. Each small part is like unto the whole, and each member reflects the glory of God. There's some particular virtues or skills or charisms that are going to be essential to partnering in God's mission in this rapidly changing context. We have to know who and whose we are and where we're going. We go as God's beloved creatures made in the divine image, and we go in search of that image, continually being created and recreated toward God's vision of wholeness. If we know who goes with us, we needn't be afraid. Our task is to boldly go where one man has gone before, and Jesus shows the way. Much of that journey is about going to the people and parts of God's creation who suffer the most, who are on the edges of life and abundance. We stand where Jesus stood, seeking food, justice, healing, wisdom, with and for those parts of the body with the least. There's a reason why he says the kingdom lies with attention to the least of these. Love God and do as you please. The risk is part of walking with God. And we are to go with hearts that are radically broken open to the chaos in the world around us, with eyes and ears tuned to see and hear the spirit already at work out ahead of us. This is a road of discovery of being God's creative partners in the chaos. Chaos is not evil. It is the potential for divine creative activity. It's the freedom and contingency of the created order. But new life requires choice or attention before that chaotic energy can take form. Do you remember what Moses said to the people? I have set before you today life and death. Choose life. That choosing is a creative act in the midst of chaos. It is a Godward journey. It is participation in God's mission. It is a going toward the reign of God. What do you choose? What will we choose in this body? and in the larger bodies of which we are a part? That's the question. We have some opportunity for interaction.
Maybe we could have the lights back. That's that's just fine. Just maybe maybe ask Megan. So people. Can oh, I see what you're. Okay, yeah. yeah. As you have, have a, <coughs> as you have a question, please let Bishop Catherine call upon you, and I'll bring the mic to you. Or a comment, or start of a conversation. <laughs> I'm not sure how to articulate this question because it's about language. Uh, how do you find that you must change your language as you move out into a world that does not, is not part of that network, that's not part of the um, jargon right. of Christianity? That's something, a part of what I was trying to model. Um, we can't use insider language to talk to people who don't know us. It just does not work. That's been one of the biggest struggles of the Christian tradition, particularly in the last 50 years, um, how to talk about grace and abundance without using technical language. Sin, um, disordered relationships, um, dysfunctional relationships. Um, we have to find the language that fits in the particular context where we are. Do I have any models for that? Yeah, talk to people who don't know that language. Learn from them. Learn from them. That's part of what it means to show up and listen. Listen carefully. Because the spirit, we have to believe that the spirit is already at work there. And if we're, if we're able to pay attention, we can learn something. And partners, and hopefully, filled with hope, find some new creative potential in the midst of that. Ask it, I'll repeat it like that. What's going on in the Episcopal Church right now in terms of talking to people of the Muslim faith, of people, members of Islam? Um, it tends to be very local. Uh, one of the challenges in having Christian-Muslim dialogue is that Muslims aren't organized the way Christians are in denominations. Uh, it's very local. Therefore, the most effective con conversations happen in local settings, uh, local congregations getting together. There's a wonderful example in Omaha. Uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Nebraska a Muslim congregation and a Jewish congregation have been had members speaking together, meeting together, eating together for about four or five years. They decided a couple of years ago to buy some land together and to build a worship space for each tradition and a shared space that will eventually become an interfaith study center. Uh, every person you talk to in that community talks about how much his or her own faith has been deepened in the process. You come to know who you are by encountering the image of God in your neighbor and wrestling with the, those differences. Uh, that's a remarkable example. But it takes no more than befriending someone from another tradition and starting a conversation and then expanding the circle. It's a wonderful, wonderful question. In one of the slides, you there's a uh, the Christian, the Muslim, and the Jewish. The one thing I didn't notice there was the media. The media tends to break people apart. Yeah. What are we going to do to bring to get the media to bring them together to be the glue? Model it. Hmm. Model it. Uh, the, the I talked about this in chapel this morning. 
Uh, I was part of a meeting of Abrahamic religious leaders yesterday in Washington uh, trying to strategize about how to encourage our government to push the parties in the Middle East to the peace table and not let them leave until they finish the work. Uh, that will get reported at some point, I don't know how, uh, in a public way, and it will be, it, it will happen in a way that presents all three faiths standing together. Uh, we share far more together than what distinguishes us, but like all families, it's the siblings who uh, wrestle the most over the legacy. I think the ability to, to work with people in your local community, to befriend each other, uh, and stand, stand in public together in ways that the media cannot separate you. The media like controversy because it's newsworthy. They think it's newsworthy. But it's, I think it's even more newsworthy uh, when, for example, Christians go and stand in protective bands around mosques that are being threatened by local, local bigots local bigotry. Uh, that's a remarkable witness and gets reported. Leadership, particularly in the, in the um, I'm sorry, Christian community, requires a variety of skills. What is the one skill that is essential for good Christian leadership? Hmm. I think the ability to listen. The ability to listen deeply um, to the people around you, uh, to the voice of God, both in your own heart, but in the voices of the people around you. Um, God's at work, and it's our job to discover a piece of that. Bishop Catherine, I was a, uh, one of my fellow seminarians were actually at the, the Tri-Faith Initiative dinner that you and kicked off. We were interns there. And one of the things that was so um, different about that is, is you had three faiths coming together to talk about their commonalities without giving in to the other side. I mean, we would talk about it, but we had to say that we need Jesus right. as Christians. Right. Um, can you talk about a way that we, could, we can model that going forward? I mean, it seemed that everybody was on the same page, mm -hmm. but how can we have these conversations with other faiths without um, giving in to giving up what's important to us, but, but acknowledging that it may not be there for them. Thank you. I think it, it happens by, by listening carefully. When you listen carefully and are asked to tell your own story and have people listening carefully to you, you have to discover what is most central within yourself. Um, you have to give evidence of the faith that is within you. And it doesn't happen until you, ha until you have to verbalize it. Um, that's part of the gift of a community like this. It challenges the members to speak the, the fullness of the truth that they have. It, may, it, it will never be completely formed. It's still emerging, God willing, we hope. <laughs> um, but it, in interaction, in conversation, in dialogue, it begins to take form. And people like the people at the Tri-Faith Initiative, discover what the most essential pieces are. You know, that, that we know God in human flesh. Uh, and what does that say about God? How is that um, in contrast and in congruence with what our Jewish brothers and sisters would say? You can try it here. I, I assure you, you don't all agree about all the details. <laughs> Um, a lot of us are coming here um, from different or from previous jobs, mm -hmm. previous lives or mm -hmm. different studies, and that informs the way we articulate our faith and how we think about it. I've got a friend who knows a lot about teamwork from coaching football. I have another who was a potter, and that informs her faith. And I, I don't know anything about oceanography, but I'm wondering how that has informed the way you articulate your faith and how you think about the world. And Sometimes people ask me if I was a marine biologist. And I say, no, I was an oceanographer, a biological oceanographer. And it's a difference in focus. Oceanographers think about the system. 
think about the whole community, the whole body, if you will. And they talk about water masses as bodies, interactive, communicating uh, in an inorganic way. Um, it's understanding that no element of a body can be completely isolated. You can only begin to understand what that element is doing in relationship to the other members of a body, the other parts of a body. Um, I think in systems terms, it's one reason why Rabbi Friedman has been so helpful. Um, we, we, tend to, we have tended in the West to think in a very linear way. Uh, that was the gift of the Enlightenment. Uh, Postmodern thought is inviting us to think in interlocking layers in a different kind of complexity um, that's not as easily defined in terms of either or black and white, that thinks more systemically. Uh, and it took me a while to find the gifts out of my oceanographic work that were going to be particularly useful in ordained ministry. I read a book called The Minister is Diagnostician by Paul Tukeyser shortly after I finished seminary. It was very helpful. You have to find what that gift is for you. It will be something different. As a scientist and a theologian, I find myself thinking of Senator Rubio's comments the other day about the age of the earth. And um, I mean, as you are a scientist and a theologian. Um, and so I'm wondering about a dialogue, the dialogue between, within the Christian church, churches, about that, about what some see as a dichotomy between science and religion. Um, is that kind of conversation going on within our own, between the denominations of the Christian faith in this country? I don't know where it's going on in a, in a formal way. I think it tends to go on in a more local um, individual encounter. Uh, where it does happen in a more formal way tends to be around school board issues and what will be taught. I'm serious. I'm quite serious. Uh, and I think it's a very significant place where people of this tradition can have a, a major impact on the larger community by inviting... I think part of it's about fear that a story that is deeply meaningful will be taken away. Um, I don't live with just one creation story. I live with three. The two in Genesis and the cosmological evolutionary story of creation. And I don't see them as in conflict. I see a much richer view of the world for being able to use all three of them. And, and some of the other stories of origin that come from other traditions, some of the Native American ones are deeply meaningful. Um, they help, help us to see a, a broader understanding of what it means to be a human being in relationship with the divine and in the relationship with the rest of what is. It just seems, hello. Yeah. It seems as if some of the distrust that's built up between factions in, in our country is owing to this inability to accept that the stories are not necessarily incompatible. I don't know. I don't see a dialogue between these factions, really. I think the dialogue has to start at the human level and recognizing the image of God in somebody who doesn't see the world the way we do or you do. Um, it's... It's a fear of the other that really is at a, at a level that says, you're going to dismiss me at the least or destroy me at the most. Um, I need to exist. <laughs> it's about treating people with dignity. It's building relationships is the most important, and we can get to the details later.
also just um, what kinds of things do you think that do we need to make changes in our in the way we do theological education? And if so, what would they be to to help us with a body theology? I think recognizing that there's no one way to form and educate leaders. Uh, we need a variety of methods and journeys, routes, because we need leaders in a variety of contexts. We need as many seminary trained, thoroughly educated, well-grounded, broad, theologically educated, broadly theologically educated leaders as we could produce. But I don't think they're all going to be parish priests in one congregation. I think they're going to be, more and more of them are going to be equippers and sustainers of other leaders in the church, both lay and ordained. They're going to function more in the way that bishops have, um, or regional vicars. Um, they're going to function as overseers of and encouragers of other people's ministries, leadership gifts. We need the ability to form and educate and train leaders for very local, particular contexts. It can be deforming for somebody from an, a subsistence um, economy to put that person in an academic environment for three years and then send him or her back and expect him or her to function in that context. But we need leaders living in that context, like worker priests, who are gifted for leadership development and can draw on gifts of the larger body to sustain and equip and grow that, that mission. We need a variety. And they need to be interconnected and networked and drawing on, sharing the resources that are available. It's unsustainable only if we insist that there's only one way to do it. As we uh, ponder leadership development and the importance of it, how do we keep leadership free to grow and prosper when it's a normal process in what I call institutionalism, whether it's a church, the larger church, political system, or whatever, to eventually, uh, you know, every every so many years, we'll have a big commotion in, in the institution. They'll begin to focus on, naturally focus, on self-preservation and on self-determination because that serves self-preservation. And it tends to squash leadership. Leadership is growth, growth is painful. Institutions have a difficult time with that. What's the best way to keep our institutions on track? Well, I, I think that's one of the things that we're trying to do as a church-wide body um, in terms of restructuring. We're trying to find, a, a, I hope and believe and trust that we're looking for a, a way of being in community as the Episcopal Church that's less rigid, that is more agile um, and more responsive. And yeah, eventually, if we, if we do that at the next general convention, we have to remember that we'll have to do it again in 20 years or 10 years or 50 years because there's no perfect solution. Um, as soon as we make an idol out of what the structure is, it's done. It's cooked. <laughs> it's toast. It's the it's the the eternal challenge of real of conversion. We have to live a converting life, continually converting life, because we never do it perfectly, and we will not until the last judgment. And we need prophets in our midst who continue to prod the institution to open up and breathe. <laughs> find a little more of God's spirit, um, and let go of what's dead. And it's not easy work.
you turned it on in a minute. <laughs> if you okay. <coughs> I wonder if you know of any stories of a saint or another historical figure which might act as a kind of anecdote for the challenges that the church suffers or uh, faces today. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How about Columba? How about Columba? Who, who left behind the familiar and sailed across the sea and started something new in the wilderness and kept sending other people to do the same thing. I, I spent three weeks in the UK in September as a mini sabbatical because I've never been able to be a tourist there. I've only gone for meetings. <laughs> I'm serious. And I wanted to see the monasteries and the cathedrals and go to Iona and Lindisfarne. Uh, it was a remarkable experience. What I saw were lots of beautiful ruins. <laughs> the monasteries that Henry um, shut down. Um, but I also saw that stones that were used to build those remarkable edifices, it was like the gospel we heard today, <laughs> those stones got reused. They got reused to build um, houses, big fancy houses sometimes, forts, fences, walls, sometimes new buildings. You can see monastic ruins in England and Scotland that have new walls built on top of them. And sometimes those stones are used to, in new churches. That's what we need to do. Continually you know, letting the old die, sometimes tearing it down, and then building something new. And I also saw lots of these ancient cathedrals far more um, engaged with the current realities in England and Scotland and the communities around them than many of our churches are. The doors are wide open um, every day of the week. There's a cafe in the church. There are art exhibits in the, in the nave. Um, there are concerts. Uh, there are school children in one place in monastic habits learning about the monastic tradition on a school field trip. We, we don't use the great riches we have as effectively as we should. And if we don't, then they ought to die. Yeah, way in the back. Okay, Michael. Communion and autonomy, are they the same, are they different, and what's happening? The, the story about the Tri-Faith Initiative in Omaha is about communion and autonomy. It's about self-definition, clarity about who you are and what's most central to your story, in relationships with other people who are equally well differentiated. But there's enough vulnerability or porousness about the individuals in the relationship that you can learn from each other. And that deepens the relationship, that deepens the need. Um, I saw that at the Anglican Consultative Council in New Zealand in October, early November. Um, people, th the anxiety has gone down far enough that people are able to be more vulnerable and honest about who they are and what they value and where their growing edges are and where they disagree with other people without deeply seated anger. They're not feeling threatened, so the anger is dissipated. Autonomy is essential. It's about you can't love somebody else unless you love yourself.
Welcome. We have a w wonderful reception immediately behind the curtain here, and I don't want to wear Bishop Catherine completely out. She has to be with us again tomorrow. So, I did. Um, I'm wondering what your personal ideas are about the roles and expectations of college students, young college students, in the church, both locally and on a broader scale. Roles and expectations of young college students in the church and and on a broader scale. On a broader scale. Um, tell me more. What are you looking for? <laughs> Outside of things, obviously, like campus ministries in particular, mm -hmm. um, in um, normal local parishes, there's just isn't much. It, there doesn't seem to be a place for um, younger college students. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. what your ideas are should be to to integrate younger college students into the community and to provide them with roles, um, le both leadership roles and otherwise. Ask them what they want to do, or how they want to be there and what, what they need out of the community, what they have to offer the community, um, what they want the church community to be doing in the wider world. Um, that's often, the I think, the edgiest part. You know, why isn't this congregation doing X? Um, that usually is a source of great life and transformation for everybody. Um, the same question came up with the group after lunch today. What, I, what is the role of a particular age group in the church? Well, you have to claim it. And they have to pester, the, usually the elders, um, to make room and to change. And that's your job, and it's a pathetic one, and it's not always easy, but you have allies. <laughs> you have allies. Yeah. And it, sometimes it helps to remind your elders that they were that age once. What did they do, and what was the what didn't they like about how they were treated or engaged or ignored? Um, so what are you gonna? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's all right. It's okay. Do you see the Episcopal Church starting to grow in members again, and? <laughs> What sort of things might have to die or we let go before that happens? Oh, oh what a wonderful question. Um, <laughs> I think growth is about more than numbers. And I think we have an idolatry of numbers in some places. Um, that said, it's not, it's not necessarily a bad measure because it says something about how invested we are in evangelism, in forming the children we do produce, which aren't very many in this church, um, and, re and retaining them in this tradition, uh, or blessing their growth in ways that they go on a journey that continues to contribute to the healing of the world. I think this church as a whole has left much of this conflict about sex behind us, that we're in a we're in a new day about that. Um, we don't all agree, but we've remembered that we love each other and we're going to live together, even if we don't like what she thinks over there or she says over there. Uh, I think we are moving into a place where we're engaging very different contexts than, have, than where the Episcopal Church has traditionally been present. Uh, the growing edge of this church is about immigrant communities in the United States. Uh, the growing di the dioceses outside of the United States are almost all growing, and some very quickly. Uh, the growing edge also in the Episcopal Church is about blue-collar communities. We've been present in some of those places, but not many. Uh, we have gifts to offer in all contexts, but we have not always been bold about going out of our church buildings into the community to share the good news we know. Uh, and I think that's the biggest challenge. Fito, thank you. 
Bishop Catherine will be with us for morning prayer at 9.30 in the morning. And Scott, where are you, Bader Say? Scott Bader Say and Tony Baker, two of our wonderful professors, are going to be interviewing her here at 10.30. And so I look forward to seeing as many of you come back as is possible. Right now, please join us for a reception uh, honoring Bishop Catherine and our 60th anniversary. And let's give her a warm round of applause.